Hey friends, it's Dr. Jackson. And before we get into our episode this week, I just wanted to give you a little bit of idea of what we're talking about. So this week we are talking about mental health. It is so important before we talk about taking steps, before we talk about launching into our passions and our education and leading other people, that we take care of the foundation, the things that mean more than anything else. As the Bible says, as a man thinks, so is he. And I am a witness. I've seen so many leaders who have neglected taking care of themselves and they have an impact on the entire organization. How can you lead other people if you are hurting yourself? We end up being hurt people who hurt other people. So I encourage you leaders of your home, of your job, of your organizations, whatever you lead, if you're aspiring to lead, if you're leading nobody, Nothing we do can be successful until we take care of the foundation. As a man thinks, so is he. Let's talk about how we deal and how we take care of our mental health. Let's get into it. Hey, hey, everybody. This is Dr. Patrice Buckner Jackson, but you can call me PBJ. And this is the Love Always PBJ podcast. Listen, this is my letter of love to millennials. And y'all know what we're about. We believe in an identity that is securely rooted in Christ, purpose that flows from a heart to serve, and relationships that are worth the call somebody holler if you hear me now listen i have been telling you this for weeks if you are not following me on instagram you are missing out on your spoonful of pbj that comes every monday to get your life together come on get a little joy in your life so follow me at dr patrice buckner jackson on instagram make sure you get your spoonful of pbj every monday and of course every wednesday there's a brand new episode of the love of always PBJ podcast y'all listen we are here to help support encourage you concerning your identity your purpose and your relationships this is all about millennials and you live in your best life and I am so excited y'all I have had some friends join me the last few weeks and when I say tonight not just friends, but I got my sisters. You hear me that these ladies and I have walked through life together. And I am so honored that they have said yes to serve us tonight. Y'all, we're talking about mental health tonight. We're talking about mental health. Remember, our series is Take a Step. It is time for us to put some action behind our passion. It is time for us to put some work behind our word. We're not just waiting on 2021. We're not waiting on the vision board party. We're not waiting on January to hit. But now is the time to start taking steps towards the goal that we all want to accomplish. 2020 has been rough for everybody. And I'm not diminishing anybody struggles because God knows it's been significantly rough for some people. But what I'm trying to tell you is if you are a person who has a fire in your belly for something and there's something that you know you should be doing, we want to push you, press you, motivate you, and encourage you that now is the time. There is no better time than right now. But hear me when I say your mental health is the foundation for you doing anything well. Listen, we are not all about looking pretty on Instagram and having the best filter and your mind is a mess. That is not what we are going to encourage you to do here, but it is about mind, body, spirit, all aligning and moving forward together. So not just the pretty things. We're not chasing shiny things. We like shiny things. That's beautiful, but let that come later. Let's get our foundation right y'all so we're gonna get into it my sisters are here and they are experts and professionals in this area so I called on them to help us tonight as we talk about our mental health and how to take care of our mental health as we are taking steps towards our goals towards our purpose towards our passion so here we go sisters please tell the people who you are well thank you for having us here first of all I'm so excited um, I am Brittany Flowers. I'm a master's level clinician in clinical mental health. 
I am nationally certified and I'm board certified at the associate level in the state of Georgia. Um, I graduated from Georgia Southern twice. I'm a double eagle. Um, <laughs> the second um, time I graduated, I got my master's. And about a month and a half later, I started working um, for the Department of Corrections through a contracted company. Um, the funny thing about that is Dr. Hunt is probably somewhere laughing because I told her I never wanted to work in addictions or with inmates. And I worked in a prison doing substance abuse counseling. And I loved it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I actually worked there from 2017 up until this past Monday. That was my last day there. Um, I've done work in private practice part-time since I started at the prison, kind of off and on um, at someone else's practice, not my own, but one day. Yeah. Um, and so I'm now full-time working in the private practice area. So I'm in the community um, I treat a little bit of everything, but I mostly see um, families and couples, a lot of work with OCD, anxiety, depression, uh, and that's probably what I see the most of right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Brittany, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm excited for your transition. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yes. My name is Judicial Humphreys. I go by Jade. Um, I'm also, like Brittany, a double eagle. Um, before I get into my career in mental health, um, I want to start by saying that I just like helping people. Counseling is the way, one of the ways that I found that I am effective in doing that. Um, but outside of my career, I'm a mom to four, I'm a wife, um, and those are some of my roles that I am so proud of and that kind of keep me grounded in all of this, um, uncertainty with COVID and pandemic and my career work. Um, I graduated from Georgia Southern in 2014 with my bachelor's of science in psychology. I went on to graduate in 2016 with my clinical mental health um, master's degree. After that, and somewhere in the mixture of that, um, I fell into student affairs. Um, and I always bring this up when I talk about my counseling work because in student affairs and in the, in the dean of students office is where I met Dr. Jackson, is where I met Brittany, mm -hmm. is where I got a bulk of my experience in crisis work, is where I fell into suicide prevention work. Yes. It was really where I built that toolkit in advocacy, for, you know. And so I stayed there for about four years. I left to be at home with my babies to help them develop and grow in their learning. And somewhere in between that time, I started back with my suicide prevention work, um, giving presentations to the community. And I started working for a private practice in the Statesboro community as well. So within that practice, I had the opportunity to see little babies through middle schools, all the way up to, um, adults about 40 years old. So that's where I got more experience. Currently, I'm back at Georgia Southern in the counseling center as a mental health counselor. Um, and then I still kind of do outside work with the private practice. I still see some of my, my babies and my older clients as well. Oh, Jade, it is so good to have you tonight. And listen, y'all, I'm getting all the updates while y'all getting the <laughs> updates, okay? I did not know all the transition was going on, and I'm so proud of these women. Um, I've had the honor of walking with them and watching their journeys for several, several years. And um, I can tell you that tonight you're hearing from the best. You're hearing from the Thank best. You. So but listen, before we get into this, let me make one thing clear, my friends. This is not therapy tonight. Okay, we are going to encourage you, give you lots of information for you to consider, but please know that it is important that you have your own therapist, your own consultation. Everybody's situation is different, so please don't assume that any specific strategy or tactic is something that you immediately need to apply to your life. Please, we encourage you to make sure you are working with your own personal therapist for your path, your plan. And our goal tonight is to motivate you and encourage you concerning mental health. All right, y'all, let's get into it. Let's go. Let's just start with 2020. Okay. Let, let's just, let's just do it. Um, never in my whole entire life ever, ever did I expect that we would see anything 
like we have seen in this past year. And I know we keep saying 2020, 2020, we don't know when it's going to end Mm -hmm. Um, the pandemic, but it hasn't just been the pandemic. It's felt like layer upon layer upon layer. So from your expert opinion, what has been the impacts of 2020 on our mental health, on our collective mental health? I like how you said collective, because literally we have all been going through this experience and it's become this collective trauma for everyone. Everyone is carrying a weight. Um, and then you have the regular life transitions, having a baby, starting a new, new job, going back to school. And then you have this overarching layer, this overarching weight of in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. You're going to appointments to have your baby by yourself. Mm. You are an in-person learner, but you're having to learn all of the academic work in a virtual setting. So I feel like there is definitely this collective weight that everyone is carrying mm -hmm. and having to manage and deal with. Yeah, yeah. I definitely agree. And you kind of touched on one thing that I was thinking about when you asked that question, what popped in my mind was the word diverse. And it's diverse in a sense that yes, it does affect, you know, different social economic groups, different races, but also the way that it lands in people's lives. So mm. the clients that I've seen have come in, maybe they have anxiety because they're afraid to get sick. They're afraid to die. Maybe they're dealing with grief because they already lost somebody to COVID. Maybe they're dealing with grief because they've lost normalcy in their life. Um, for example, like going to school, going to work, having to do everything from home. Um, those people who like to be out and about hugging and talking, having to stay indoors, um, that can trigger depression for people. So just seeing how everybody's coming in with an attachment to the pandemic, but the issues are so diverse for mm -hmm. all of these different people. Yeah. Uh, Brittany, I love the way you say the way it lands um, for, for each person, because although we have this in common, our response to it and our specifics about around it or surrounding it um, are very, very, very different. You know, um, my husband and I, one of our struggles is we haven't seen our daughter in months. You know, she's a college student. She's away and she's OK. She's got her own apartment all as well. But we haven't seen our baby. You know, we never thought that it would be at a point where we would discuss, is it safe for her to come visit? Are we OK? Can we get together for Christmas? I have a nephew I haven't met. You know, I have family members that I haven't seen. We haven't seen our parents. Um, you know, so yes, the way that it lands for each person is so different. It's so different. Let's drill down a little bit because this is a love letter to millennials, right? So just in general, um, and, and just working in, in higher education and working in university, it feels like, I don't know if it's true or supported, but it feels like, um, the, uh, epidemic of, of mental health concerns seem to be growing. And I don't know if it's growing or if we're more aware of what's going on. How do you describe the mental health of your generation of, of millennials? I would definitely say within the pandemic that it's worsening. Like if someone already had anxiety or depression, yeah. it's amplified. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and just going back to what Brittany said, that grief and loss piece, there are a lot of millennials who have lost their coping mechanisms, that family support, even that physical touch. Mm. Even if someone has COVID, they lose their sense of, of smell. Some people like to smell candles to cope, to relax. So I definitely say that it has worsened some, but also it ha has brought it to the forefront because so many people are taking note of it. So many people are now becoming more um, aware of it. Um, even when I think about listening to the radio, celebrities mm -hmm. are coming out saying more about it on the radio station and, hey, we need to take care of our mental health. So I definitely think it's on a, a bigger platform than it has been in a while. 
Yeah, yeah. Just that um, the way you just describe grief and loss, right? So for those of us who haven't lost a, a, a close loved one to death, we may not consider that we're dealing with grief and loss. But the way that you just described it, there are many ways that people may be impacted. Some people have lost their jobs. You know, mm -hmm. some people have lost security. Is it safe to go to the grocery store? Really? I mean, is it safe for my child to go to school? Um, and so the impact of grief and loss, right? And then there are... Um, Stage, the stages of grief could that be real even if it's not the the death of our loss or loss of a person is it possible to go through the stages of grief for other things absolutely yeah it is yeah. and and even the loss of traditions mm. the loss of um normalcy there is no end to the pandemic there is no so a lot of times we can deal with certain situations within that short burst because we have that adrenaline. We're yeah. getting through that transition. We're dealing with that stress quickly, but now we've even lost, okay, well, where, when is this weight gonna leave? Like it's been here and it's still here and we still don't know. So I've even, some people have even lost that sense of, am I really like, am I really managing this well? Because mm -hmm. I've never had to manage anything else like that. Can I even trust myself? Like what is going on? Yeah. 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 I definitely agree with um, what Jay was saying as far as it seems like, yes, it is more prevalent, but it's also more in our faces. And I think part of that too is the shift to telehealth. Mm -hmm. Because now that we talk about, okay, you don't have to leave your home to come to the office, more people are willing to be like, okay, well, maybe I will talk to a therapist in my room. So now that more people are doing it, and it's becoming more acceptable to talk to a therapist, I think more people are willing to have that conversation of like, okay, maybe this is worth talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and millennials are really open to, you know, moving forward and doing things the progressive way. So maybe a while ago therapy wasn't necessarily something you wanted to do but now it's kind of becoming more of a trend in a sense and it's like if you got issues you need to go heal and so more people are willing to do it so Brittany and and jade absolutely as well how do i know if it's just normal how do i know if it's just normal stress you know, just normal things are hard right now and I'm going to be all right versus this is pretty serious and, and it's getting, I don't know, maybe critical. Like how do, cause one of the things that people struggle with is I don't think I need it. I mean, I think I'm normal. I think I'm okay. So how, how do I gauge that? Okay. So, um, there's kind of like a two part to that for me. One thing I always tell people is if it's a problem for you, it's a problem. It doesn't matter if somebody else thinks that your anxiety yeah. can be handled by you just walking outside and taking some deep breaths. Maybe that in itself is an issue for you, the fact that I have to go outside and do that. So if you feel like this is a struggle for me, then to me, that's worth going to therapy. And on the other hand, if it interrupts daily life, if I can't function I can't just go to work and do my job. I can't just take care of my children and my husband without mm -hmm. this background thing hanging over me, then that's worth me going to address and getting some help for it. Because whatever I've been doing, those coping skills are not working or I don't have any. Yeah. So I need to go and get help with that. Mm, absolutely. And I would just say, yes, like if your eating is disrupted, sleeping is disrupted if the if it's getting too much for you to kind of manage if it's persistent is if it's frequent um but definitely if it is impairing your ability to do the things that you do throughout your daily life right if you you know notice that you're not taking care of yourself um that your hygiene or what you would usually do for your hygiene practices if they're slipping to a point where I'm drowning, like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm up to my head. There's no way that I can get out. I, I can't, I'm paralyzed. Um, and I think back to the fight or flight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
there are two more that we usually don't talk about the freeze or the flop mm -hmm. if you're finding that everything is like chaotic you can't make sense of it all like Brittany mentioned if you try things and it's not working or if you're just like autopilot mm -hmm. everything is like I'm, I'm losing senses to everything that's going on around me I'm just numbing not feeling any emotions i'm mm -hmm. shutting down it's probably time to see to seek that help to seek that professional help oh that's so good because what you, both of you just did is you made it so real Brittany, did you have something else i was just gonna say that when jay was talking it kind of brought back up what she mentioned earlier about how the pandemic almost has no end mm -hmm. and so you kind of fall into that place where um for example one thing people can do when they're anxious is wash their hands in hot water or cold water, whichever they prefer to calm themselves down. Okay, that may have worked for me March, April, May. Okay, this mm -hmm. isn't going anywhere. We hit August mm -hmm. and I go to the bathroom to wash my hands and it's not working. I get more anxious because it's not working. Then at that point, I need help. So maybe I can try something else, but it may not work. So it's almost like in the pandemic, you need layers of coping skills because it goes on so long to the point where that makes me wonder if maybe that's also why we have so many more people coming to therapy because they were coping, but mm -hmm. it's no longer working. This, this is also good. And my mind is all over the place because you just said skills, Brittany. So when you say skills, that suggests to me that I can learn something yeah. I can learn something to do. So sometimes when we think of therapy, we automatically think of medication. We think of hospitalization. We think of sickness or illness, mm -hmm. but you just said skills. Mm -hmm. So help me make that connection between skills and therapy. So um, it, what you mentioning the medication. Now there are some people that come in there, they sit down and I can almost immediately realize that whatever's going on cannot be fixed by me teaching you a coping skill. This needs medication. But there are some things that you can actually take control of yourself by learning different coping skills. So it may be, you know, this has me feeling really worked up. Well, let's identify what triggered it. We figure out what triggered it. Now what can bring it back down to a lower level? And so um, in therapy, your therapist can suggest different things to you from deep breathing, meditation, um, walking you through it, doing it with you in the office um, and let you see like, how does it feel for you? You know, my anxiety was an eight before we did it and now I'm at a two. So maybe this is something I should use at home. Um, sometimes we may do something and they like, I don't know what it was, is, but I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so yeah. we know that that coping skill doesn't work for them. So um, it's like you said, it's just a learning process and the therapist goes through it with you. They won't just hand you a list of like, here goes some stuff you can do. Um, actually walking through with you and learning the skills that um, could work for your anxiety, depression, whatever it is. And then sometimes you may have to go back to the drawing board and be like, this was working for me and now it's not. And then the therapist goes back to the drawing table with you and try something different. I believe in this moment, we are peeling back the, the fear and the anxiety and the veil off of what therapy can do. Because yes, there is medication. Yes, there's hospitalization for people who need that. But that's not how it works for everybody. And that's not necessarily where it might start for anybody who's listening according to what they need. So you all help us walk through in a, in a simple summarized way, what is a counseling therapy session like what could one expect well I think first there would definitely be a review of confidentiality um so reviewing okay what you share this is your space this is your time um, but there are certain things that we are mandated to tell you know if you want to harm yourself harm the others child or elderly abuse and I think specifically within the virtual setting of therapy, we want to verify where you are, mm -hmm. just in case we have to get someone to you. And we want to verify some safety information with you because we want to make sure that you're safe. Mm -hmm. um, after that, you know, we kind of talk about goals. What brings you into counseling? What are some of the concerns that you have? 
um, and we work through and we talk through. And like Brittany said, it really is this process, this interchange. What works for you? Okay, this doesn't work for you. So, so we're not here to say we're going to talk about this or we're going to force you to do mm-hmm. these things. We're here to listen to you and to provide those strategies and tips and not only to throw them at at you but to walk with you through them with you to Mm -hmm. listen to um what things that you're bringing to us so it is definitely a a interactive a supportive reflective um process it can be messy at times like it's not always clean cut no learning process is um it's trial and error let's Mm -hmm. see if this works if it doesn't, let's go back to the drawing board, like Brittany mentioned. Um, but yeah. And one thing I want to touch on too, with everything Jay just said, I know a lot of people are skeptical because they feel like there's no way this person is going to know me. But throughout that whole process, the therapist is taking time to build rapport with you. They're trying to build a relationship with you, learning you specifically, what do you like? Um, what bothers you, what triggers you so that, like she said, everything is tailored around you. So that time is your time and the therapist is basing everything off of um, what you like and what you respond well to. Mm -hmm. So the relationship becomes a really close relationship. It's a therapeutic relationship, but um, most people who've been in therapy for a long time they really value that relationship because they know it is uniquely about them um one thing one of my professors taught me was you know a lot of times people will say well you have friends you can talk to but our personal relationships are very different the therapeutic relationship is so unique because you don't have any relationships in your life that are specifically about you Mm. usually you know with our friends we already know what they're going to say when we tell them specific things um they know our history They've seen us in all these different arenas and they do have a bias. Um, A therapist does not, they don't know you. So it's very neutral um, and they're not there to give you advice or to judge anything you say. So Mm -hmm. it's a very unique relationship. Oh, I'm so glad you went there. And I was literally thinking that because I have encouraged family members and others, you know, because some people will say, well, I just like talking to you. Well, that's fine, Mm -hmm. but I love you. Yeah. And automatically, because I love you, I have a bias. Right. <laughs> because we yeah. have a relationship, we have, not in a negative way, but right. because I love you, I want to fix it. I want to make it better. I want to make it go away. And your therapist is trained to know that, okay, we're not skipping over this. We're mm-hmm. not going to make it go away. <laughs> and I'm not emotionally attached. When I go home, I'm going to be all right, but right. I'm going to help you walk through this for you. And not because we have a love relationship where I need to get something and you get something as well. Mm-hmm. So the people who love you, they they love you for real, but that that innately means there's a bias there. Right. Um, so it's mm-hmm. not the same thing as talking to your best friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now y'all know I grew up in the church, right? <laughs> I grew up in the church. <laughs> and um, we didn't talk about therapy. We did not talk about going to counseling. We tarried and we prayed and we called on Jesus and we cast stuff out. And, and I'm, I'm not, don't get me wrong now. I still believe in the foundations of the church. (laughs) Help me understand. And let's talk about the intersection of faith and therapy. And how do I justify in my faith? that I need to seek this kind of help or support? There are a couple of things that come up when I think about this intersection Um, because I grew up in the church as well and we didn't talk about mental health. You know, we gonna pray it out, we gonna cast it out. Um, One thing that was kind of a light bulb moment for me when I started getting into the education of counseling is I never seen mental health or it was never put that mental health was possibly a physical thing. Mm. It was always that it was a spiritual thing. So it made sense to me in that moment why why the, the solutions were always spiritual. Pray it out, cast it out. Through my education, I learned that it could quite possibly be a spiritual thing and a physical thing. It could be um, this this person is battling something spiritually 
And also there's a chemical imbalance that they were born with. Mm -hmm. So there is a merge, there is an intersection and it becomes more so of a, a toolkit. I can pray about it and I can go see my therapist to get some skills to put in my toolkit. Um, and as I'm praying about it and I'm walking out, praying about it, walking out, it helps me build my relationship with Christ because yeah. now I'm like, Lord, you know, I went to this, I went to this therapy, I went to this counseling appointment and I just made this connection between where I am now and my past. God help me to, mm -hmm. to, to heal. God help me to, it makes that relationship with Christ a little bit more intimate and opens that, that prayer and opens that, that desire and need for God to kind mm -hmm. of intervene in ways where, I didn't even recognize that about myself now. God, I need you even the more. Oh my gosh, I love that. Absolutely. Yes, I love the, that you pointed out how in the church it really was, or sometimes it is seen as a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. And we later learned that it could be physical. Um, I actually had the same experience, but didn't realize it that way until you just said it. Um, <laughs> And for me, the way I, I've always kind of pictured in, in my mind is in my prayer life, this is like my lifeline to my relationship with Christ. In therapy, this is the lifeline to my relationship with myself. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm doing both, then I can find my identity in Christ. I can find myself, but I have to know who I am in Christ to really know myself. So then again, they come back together. Um and I feel like for me, I couldn't have one without the other. Um, because if my mental health is not in the right space, I feel like you open yourself up to a lot of spiritual things you're not ready for. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of people have different um, spiritual journeys at their own, especially now. There's a lot of different things out there. Um, and sometimes those things pour over into mental health. And I've heard some therapists even struggle with distinguishing between if a person was having a mental, like psychotic experience, or if it was a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of that stuff gets intertwined. Um, if it's not basically taken care of individually, like, are you going to therapy for your mental health and taking care of your spiritual health as well? Um, because you don't know, you know, either one could be affected especially with the pandemic, there's so many things going on. So um, I think, like you said, both need to be addressed mm -hmm. to kind of bring back together that whole person. It's amazing to me how we've built this stigma around mental health. But when it comes to physical health, we don't have the same level of stigma. And most right church communities right? right you know in most church communities if you need to take medication or if you need to have surgery or if you need to get treatment you'll get the treatment and pray you know <laughs> we praying for brother so-and-so because he's going to have surgery tomorrow like that is that's okay but for some reason when it comes to mental health we have not accepted that I can pray believe God know him love him and have a therapist <laughs> and get my mind right you know I listened to uh Dr. Anita Phillips um the in the light podcast yes. you know and she I, I love it and I, if you haven't heard it you need to go hear it because it, especially if you're interested in this intersection of the church and therapy you need to go listen to it because her motto is prayer what is I wrote it down prayer is a weapon but therapy mm -hmm. is a strategy and it's very similar to what y'all were saying like, like why not use both right. why not yes I pray but God will give me tools you know it reminds me of the story and I'm not going to tell it right but somebody told a story about a man who was drowning and he was praying, you know, God rescue me, God rescue me. And, you know, this one person came like, no, 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 I'm waiting on God. And then a random boat came like, no, I'm, I'm waiting on God. And then somebody else came like, no, 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 I'm waiting on God. And, and the person drowned. And when he got to heaven, like, God, I mean, I asked you to rescue me and you didn't. God's like, I sent you three avenues of rescue. <laughs> I sent you three different rescues and you would not take advantage of any of them. And we put God in this box. Like he can't work through therapy as well and I love this idea that y'all presented of walking through this process of therapy opens me up to have a better relationship with God sometimes our struggle is with that relationship mm 
Mm-hmm. And, and, and for those who desire that, right? So we're talking to Christians, that's my foundation. For, for those who desire a closer walk with him, sometimes that barrier to a closer walk with him is something that we can work out in therapy. You know, a lot of times we equate our relationship with our heavenly father with the relationship with the earthly father. And if that relationship wasn't strong, it may have created some barriers to me strengthening my relationship with my heavenly father. So we can bring those powerful tools together. We don't have to deny one to have allegiance to the other. We can still love Jesus. We can still be a part of the church. We can be powerful Christians and have a therapist Mm -hmm. and have a therapist. You know, Dr. Jackson, over the years, like working in student affairs, working in counseling, um, if a client self identifies as a Christian, I can't tell you how many clients have, you know, self identified as Christians. They love God. Mm -hmm but they do not love themselves. Mm. They they do not like the way that they were made. They do not like the things that they do. And like you, like going back to what you said, it opens us up in that process of therapy to learn more about God, to learn more about ourselves, to learn more about who God made us to be. Mm. How can we love God and not and I mean, not in, and it's not just like, I don't like myself. I hate myself. Mm-hmm. I hate that I do this. Mm-hmm. So that's just, a, you know, something that I've noticed. And it's like, where's the disconnect along the way? Yeah. Where's the disconnect coming? Um, and then there's also this perfectionism growing up in the church. You have to act like you have it all together, you have to look right, act Listen. right, behave right. And Brene Brown, she said that, you know, that perfectionism, we're afraid of being judged. We're afraid of being blamed and we're, we're afraid of that shame. So we, we hold that shield up and it's heavy. Yeah. It's heavy, but we're thinking it's going to protect us when actually it prevents us from flying. But it prevents us from being real with God. Mm -hmm. It prevents us from being real with those that are around us every day. And we lose ourselves in that perfectionism. And when we actually put down the shield, which therapy is a place where you can put down that shield, even if you pick it back up when you walk out the door, Mm -hmm. it's just a space to be real. Oh, my gosh. Listen, while you're talking, I'm thinking about Adam in the garden he knew that he and Eve had messed up. Like he knew it. He knew it. And what did he do? He hid from God. Mm-hmm. He hid from God. And we still do that to this day. We still, we take on, when you talk about perfection, the church and, and y'all, I love the church. Church don't mm-hmm. come from me. Okay. I love y'all. <laughs> And I love God's people. I love God's people. (laughs) But if we don't get, if we don't expose this foolishness, we, especially when we're talking about millennials, because the millennial generation ain't playing this. They're not playing this. They're they're not the type of um, generation that'll just go along with you because you have a title. They're not just going to go with you because you stand in a pulpit and hold a mic. They're going to ask you why and want to understand why. And if it don't make no sense, they're not coming. That's just where we are. And we are losing a generation in the church because we hold on to these traditions that are not Jesus. (laughs) They're not Jesus. If I could be perfect in and of myself, I wouldn't need a savior. Am I saying go out and do whatever you want? No, absolutely not. Am I saying live a raggedy life? Yes, I said raggedy. No, that is not, that's not what I'm saying. We are to press towards the mark. We are responsible for aligning our lives with the principle of God's um, principles of God and, and doing our very best, but we are human. And when we fail, there is grace for that. There's grace for that. And I'm not talking about sloppy grace where you do whatever you want to. I'm talking about God. I am really trying and I love you for real. I love you for real. But this standard and it's all the stuff that God don't care about. 
what your hair looks like, what clothes you wear, how much makeup you wear, all of this stuff, all of this stuff that we have um, tagged as holy over the years, those are all things that have kept people out of relationship with Jesus Christ because they came to us looking for Jesus and we gave them rules. They came to us looking for freedom and we gave them tradition and we gave them bondage because if you don't live and serve the way that I live and serve, then we condemn people when the Holy Spirit does not condemn. He convicts, but he does not condemn. And the church has spent so many years condemning people that there are people who truly desire from the bottom of their hearts to love Jesus and to live for him. But because of this box and because of these rules that we have cast people out and broken their hearts, mm -hmm. The church has broken their hearts because we have, we have failed to introduce them to the love and the grace of our heavenly father. We have failed in that way. And when you talk about somebody who hates themselves, they don't even understand that they are also created by him. Right. He can't do everything else well, except you. Right. Right. You know that the, he did everything else well, except me. I don't serve a guy who messed it up. Right. He's not a guy who messed it up. We live in the world and we deal with the things of the world, but he also gives us outlets. He gives us tools. He gives us strategies. He gives us ways to, to walk and to live while we're in this world until we're with him again. Right. And we got to take advantage of all of that, y'all. We got to take advantage of all of that for somebody who is interested in trying therapy, giving counseling a try, where do you even start to find a counselor? Like what was the first step? Um, they can use a platform like psychology today. Um, they let you search in your area and it's kind of, it's actually a really good way to shop for a therapist because if you're looking for a person that does a specific type of therapy, it'll be listed on there. It shows what kind of insurance they take. Um, it talks about what kind of clients typically walk into their office. What do they offer to their clients? Um, some people are specifically looking for one that looks like them. Mm -hmm. That gives you the opportunity to find, if I'm looking for African-American female, I have the opportunity to find that there. Um, and also from your primary care physician, just talking to them about like, you know, I have this depression going on. Now they, they may give you some medication, but you can let them know, like, I just want to do talk therapy mm -hmm. and they can refer you to somebody that can do your therapy. Awesome. Great advice. So what do I look for in a therapist? Let's say I don't know what those characteristics are. Um, what are some things that, that I should be looking for? You know, sometimes just going to the first appointment. Um, I've heard once before that some therapists kind of do consultations. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not sure of the providers like within our region, but maybe just going to a session, seeing if you vibe with the counselor um, and just kind of having a list of the things that you're looking for because basically it's your experience, it's your process. If you don't connect with that counselor, then there are other therapists and counselors that you can kind of try and see which one works well with you, works well with your insurance or your financial situation, works well with your time limit, how much time do you have, what time are you free, um, but also coming in with the an idea of what you're looking for will be helpful, like mm -hmm. writing down, these are the things that I'm looking for. Um, so that way you can have a baseline to see if that person meets that. That's good advice. That's good advice. And Brittany, you mentioned earlier insurance, like some people might not realize you can apply your insurance to, to counseling. What, what other um, in, advice or information would you have for people who can say, I don't know if I can afford therapy. I mean, things are tight right now. I don't know if I can pay for it. Um, some places have sliding scale where they'll try to meet you at a more affordable amount. 
I know I once worked part-time at a private practice that did something for COVID where um, all of us agreed to see three people for free. Wow. I think there were like four counselors at that time. So we were all, um, they weren't charging for those people and we didn't get paid for those clients, but it was just pro bono work. So some places they will do pro bono work and see clients for free. Um, I'm sure they all have limits on it, but it wouldn't hurt to ask because you know you might be the only one asking and you might get it. That's another choice. That's good. That's good. That's good. Y'all, we got to leave them with some advice. So for somebody who's ready to take a step, they're ready and they're, they're determined that it's time to get out of a cycle um, or to get out of a stuck place or a hard place. Um, they're just ready to move forward. Uh, what, what advice would both of you have for somebody like that? Start small. If you really don't have the energy, because some people even don't have the energy to pursue counseling or therapy, especially within the pandemic, um, but just start small. So that may mean um, writing down, kind of journaling, you know, why, why am I, or what are the thoughts that are coming to my head? What is going on for me? Um, and even starting small as far as self-care, mm-hmm. let me go take a walk. Let me just take a couple of minutes to, to breathe, to tune in with myself. Um, I feel like the first step in the process of it's just that awareness. So whatever you do um, or whatever you have to do to kind of be still with yourself and figure out, okay, what would work best for me in this moment right now? And how can I implement that into my everyday life in small increments? Um, and two, I can get until I can get to that place where I go see a therapist or I go talk to someone kind of tune in with yourself to see what you need in this moment. That's good. That's, that's good, Jay. Really, that's really good. Um, I would have to say, make your mental health a priority. I feel like for millennials, we are all like, I got to be doing the next thing. I got to be achieving. I got to be going. I don't have time for my mental health. Um, but if you don't make your mental health a priority, your mental health will make itself a priority. <laughs> so you really, really want to make sure that you take care of your mental health before anything else. Y'all, that's so good. That's so good. Listen, I hope that you all have tuned in and that you have listened to these great perspectives. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter how strong you are, how smart you are, uh, how wealthy you are or are not all of us have a responsibility to take care of our mental health and it's the foundation it's the start as a man thinks so is he Um, it starts with how we think and the health of our thinking and our mind which affects our body in so many ways and all of it is intertwined together y'all we just we're not trying to blow up we're not trying to go viral we're not chasing shiny things we are about wholeness over here we are about living our very best life and that is physically emotionally mentally and spiritually we want to be everything that God created us to be not just for other people but for ourselves we need to be that for ourselves we want to be a good testimony all the way around and in order to do that there's work to do there's work to do we've got work to do so together tonight we encourage you to make your mental health a priority and start small you can get the new title you can get the new relationship you can get whatever the wish is on your heart but if your mental health is unstable you're gonna have a hard time enjoying it so first things first let's get ourselves together y'all focus on your mental health take small steps put it first let's move forward we are taking steps into 2021 and we are doing it together y'all so i want to thank Brittany and jade for sharing with us tonight and joining us and as always you are powerful you are significant and you are loved love always pbj